Hello, every folks, and good morning. Uh, welcome to Know Your Unit, uh, Chapter 1 Reborn Edition. So we're going to be going through the uh, classes that you can get reborn at the start of the game and the uh, intro there and kind of what they're all good for. Um, so uh, without any further ado, let's do this thing. So starting off at the very beginning here uh, is going to be our uh, our good old uh, warrior slash soldier slash Amazon slash whatever you really want to call them. Basically, uh, your arms master, uh, they've been around for uh, most of the series. I say most of the series, they've literally always been around. Um, but uh, they're your basic class that specializes in a wide variety of weapons. Um, and in this case, they're actually your premier pincer attack user as well. As far as I'm aware, anyway. Um, but basically, this uh, means that uh, they can make use of not only their wide variety of weapons, but the fact that uh, they can uh, force a crit uh, with uh, mighty impact. Uh, to uh, knock a unit backwards into another unit's pincer range. Now, the interesting thing is, pincer will basically trigger once per round, uh, per unit, um, pretty much regardless of any other conditions, as long as that uh, unit wind up, winds up with their back to one of your, uh, one of your melee characters. Now, why I say this is interesting is uh, you can set up an interesting little trap um, that the you'll see the AI make use of every now and then, uh, wherein they will expose their back. They will have their back two tiles away, facing one of their friendly units, or facing away from one of their friendly units. Uh, they will then activate uh, a tremendous impact, uh, right as uh, or mighty impact, sorry, uh, right as their turn ends. A unsuspecting AI uh, will run up and try to hit him from the back. Their accuracy is better from there, you see. At which point, they will use their Mighty Impact, technically at reduced damage, to knock that unit, unit backwards right into another unit, which will then hit them with a pincer. It's pretty fantastic. Uh, but yes, uh, basically uh, they get access to pretty much whatever you need them to do, so uh, they have uh, good uh, stat growth across the board, pretty much just uh, balanced in all things. So if you're not sure what to have somebody do, uh, just have them stick around as a warrior for a little while, and you know, they'll just kind of uh, learn their way up. It may not be perfectly optimal, but it doesn't matter. Uh, this is a great class for pretty much every uh, in every circumstance. Granted, they're not really much on the uh, magical end there, but they get access to light and heavy weapons, so both uh, parry and counterattack variants, they get access to ranged weapons, um, which makes them fantastic skirmishers. Uh, so, for example, if you want to go dagger and crossbow, that is absolutely a viable combination for them. Uh, not to mention you can still activate Tremendous Impact to guarantee a knockback uh, whenever they inevitably counter uh, if you give them a heavy weapon. Um, so if, uh, if, for example, you want to have a ranged unit that's uh, pretty good at defending themselves from other ranged units, uh, the whole uh, dagger and crossbow thing works. If you want to uh, guarantee that somebody's going to get knocked off a cliff, have them conveniently one tile away, you know, facing away from said wall or cliff, and, uh, you know, maybe uh, maybe turn around and give them a little bit of a counterattack surprise. They're great for setting up traps um, in of the uh, of the counter variety. Uh, they're great for setting up pincers, and they're pretty much uh, great for training anything that you want to train. Um, not to mention, they're a little bit easy to get considering they're uh, right at the very start. So definitely one of my favorites, uh, and they're still very fun to play with. Um, they still get uh, all of their uh, old weapon choices from before. Um, they still get all their uh, their uh, all the big swords, the little swords, the uh, the big axes, the little axes, all the hammers, all the crossbows, all the bows, all the cudgels. They get all pretty much all the stuff. They just don't get spears. All right, so let's take a quick look at their skill lists here. Uh, we got uh, fists, uh, tiny swords, medium swords, big swords, uh, axes, hammers, cudgels, whips, bows, and crossbows. Uh, we've also got a 10% uh, uh, health boost, and we've got a 10% MP boost, but wait a minute, they're not magician-y like, why do they got the MP boost? Uh, basically, it just allows you to potentially store up one extra finisher, because again, you can have them stand by and charge up their MP to effectively go uh, a bit nuts on somebody with finishers, so that is always an option. Uh, they have Pincer, they have Siege uh, for uh, sacrificing one movement and uh, breaking through Rampart Aura. Um, as well as resist to Petrify and Charm, and Mighty Impact for 100% uh, uh, hit chance, crit chance, and 100% uh, uh, finisher proc. Or not finisher proc, but uh, secondary proc. Sorry. Uh, so there we go. Uh, moving to Archers. Alrighty, next up on this list is my personal favorite. Uh, the most adaptable class uh, in the... well... 
basically throughout the series. Uh, they've always been a switch hitter back uh, from uh, March of the Black Queen and all that kind of thing, but uh, we've got the, uh, the Valkyrie and the Fencer. Uh, so, one-handed swords, spears, hammers, uh, as in the oddly specific hammers, um, bows and crossbows, and uh, yeah, your usual health and MP ups, your usual resists. Uh, they also get recruit, though. Um, they also get meditate, uh, so if you want to be spamming a whole bunch of things, uh, want to have them as a support, there you go, as well as concentration. Now, basically there isn't anything in Chapter 1 that realistically needs concentration that much. Um, their actual ma uh, magic accuracy is pretty solid, unless they've got uh, low skills. Um, interestingly enough, uh, by the way, if you do happen to be uh, doing one of these situations where you're... Uh, you're essentially uh, swapping out for uh, for different roles uh, throughout your party. Um, if you end up deciding to uh, swap in, like, let's say, two different weapon skills, you can actually train multiple weapon skills at once. Um, so, uh, yeah, if, you, if you're a caster, you put multiple weapon skills on there, you can train them uh, all uh, while you're uh, casting magic-y type stuff. So, any dang ways, um, as far as skills go, they are basically the same as they were before, however, um, they gain more, um, like for example, uh, Insight and Constitution are fairly new this early, they, uh, they were more of a Chapter 2 thing before. Um, they uh, meditate with something that they never got before. Um, concentration w is uh, new, um, and previously you had to, uh, to work in Recruit, um, but I will say uh, there is no Barricade uh, earlier on. Um, I don't know if there is any barricade later. I mean, granted, the main purpose of barricade was kind of auto training. For the most part, it was too expensive for people to really consider. Hopefully, it's somewhere. Um, honestly, I wouldn't be too surprised if it wasn't around, but either way, um, it is not in Chapter 1. So uh, let's go ahead and carry on here. All right, so I'm going to throw them straight into the deep end here, uh, because fittingly, they are also a uh, class that uh, can wade through water. Uh, innately, they don't need any particular methods of doing so. They don't need any water walking. They don't need any wade skills, anything like that. Um, previously, uh, like for example, uh, uh, many uh, many classes in the PSP version uh, would pick up uh, Wade uh, throughout the game at different levels, and uh, you know just would allow them to go into the water. But uh, Valkyries have always been a partially amphibious class, um, so they can uh, just go in there uh, for however that suits your purposes. Um, this does mean that on certain maps, for example, if you decided to go sword and crossbow on them, you could just hide in the water while nobody can get close. Um, in many ways, this is kind of why uh, barricades always seemed like a little bit of an odd choice for them in uh, PSP. Um, now, most of the time, barricades were used for choosing the game, admittedly. Like, for example, if you put down a barricade, uh, you would surround two uh, units in, in them in entirely and just have, uh, like, for example, two clerics beat the hell out of each other while everybody else warped out of the map. Um, so in this particular case, uh, yeah, you can just use Wade, as you always did. Um, now, as far as their builds go, uh, Sword and Board is the obvious uh, defensive option here. Uh, you have uh, ranged options if you want. Uh, they actually function pretty well as a tribrid. Um, they're, uh, they're pretty good on the offensive side. They're not going to be hitting as hard as the dedicated Spellcaster, but they are definitely uh, uh, serving their role pretty well here. They are threatening enough to, uh, to do something good there. Uh, they're limited to missile attacks and instills, however, um, no matter uh, the element, they still have access to uh, 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 to uh, uh, heal, they still have access um, uh, well, to a couple of debuff removals, I believe. Um, but either way, uh, Define was always an option that was available to them, however, in the PSP version, it was basically the optimal play, uh, because you would simply, you know, put them on Divine, and then that was the only thing that you would ever need to consider for them. It's just Divine had easily, you know, five or six times more of the options of anything else. So unless somebody already had a particular augment and you just didn't want to, you know, min-max, you pretty much were just fine going for uh, for that one there. Uh, by the way, so that was a good example of... Um, so I have noticed in the, uh, in the training mode, I believe uh, the AI uh, does... Um, it basically just plays more risky. I feel like the AI, I mean, obviously it's training mode, they're not taking it as seriously, um, but compared to story fights, the AI in the training mode does definitely seem to intentionally put itself in bad positions more often. Again, it would make sense, you know, it is training after all. So as far as uh, finisher access and stuff like that on these guys, uh, something like Ruination actually works a little bit differently than before, just figured I'd bring that up. Um, because Ruination before used to be a one-tile thing, now it is effectively still technically a one-tile hit, um, but they are able to uh, target two tiles away. Um, it does check for line of sight, so you can't target behind somebody. Um, 
So that was kind of its uh, its one vision thing that you could uh, silent snipe someone on this one. Um, it is a straight damage move. Actually, before I forget, I meant to mention this for the archers. There was a question over whether or not they got access to leaden still. Uh, yes, uh, dark weight does still leaden. Um, however, uh, dull bind on the um, on the crossbow uh, does not seem to uh, to break legs anymore. So we'll see how that ends up playing out. Um, again, I don't really have too much information on how many of the uh, debuffs might have changed uh, that I would be able to share. Um, so, um, you know, we'll uh, deal with that as it goes along. Um, and yeah, that about covers that. So, as you can see, two of them, even on AI, are perfectly capable of taking on a team almost three times their size. Um, so, there we go. Alright, so y'all have a... Uh, okay, hang on, let's move on to the next one. Alrighty, next uh, we have the old favorite archers. Now this time around they are a little bit different. Now, you might say immediately that, uh, hey, you know, uh, we've seen some previews, uh, we've seen that their power's a little bit lower than before, but not really. Um, basically, it works a little bit like this. Uh, their first initial shots are slightly lower than before, however, their uh, tremendous shot is ridiculously powerful. Um, so, for example, they start off low, but they effectively double their power within a couple rounds. Um, on top of that, their finishers seem to do a fantastic job of getting past most armors, though they don't necessarily scale as high as before. Though uh, it may be notable that uh, if you happen to get any uh, crit cards on them, their finishers are still perfectly capable of, uh, of uh, inflicting crits. So, for example, if you were to pick up a couple crit cards on, a, uh, on an archer that's been able to keep themselves going for three or four rounds, they will absolutely be able to uh, throw out some pretty ridiculous numbers. But again, their movement is low, their, uh, uh, their overall uh, power in the first couple rounds is a little lower than uh, some of the other classes, but uh, they still are absolutely capable of hitting like a truck, and their build options are more viable than ever. Uh, so, for example, uh, back on PSP, you could always give them a dagger as a defensive option, and they had the option to parry with it, but realistically, well, they could parry or deflect with it, but that was the thing, you never knew what exactly they might run into, so while you could, for example, put a deflect on them later on, um, it's something that was pretty unreliable, uh, because the thing had to actually roll in order for it to get any training, meaning that you were more than likely going to have a class that was stuck with a 5% chance to trigger that skill at all times. Now. The new parry system feels like a combination of uh, the uh, parry and deflect thing at approximately rank 3, if I were to guess, uh, based off of uh, how often it rolls, so you're looking at roughly somewhere in the ballpark of what feels like a 15% chance to uh, have a skirmisher build uh, deflect away a hit with a knife or, you know, s suddenly save themselves um, if they happen to get caught. So this means that skirmisher builds are more viable than ever. However, it should be noted that uh, if you are... Uh, deciding to uh, put away your longbows or heavy crossbows uh, for a light uh, crossbow or a short bow of a uh, different variety, um, it should be notable that, uh, yes, their skills definitely want to be trained up a little bit higher than everybody else because they are going to be having a harder time uh, punching through armor in that situation. I mean, armor penetration is something that the class suffers with in general, so any options that you have to do so will be absolutely fantastic. Now one thing I will note on your archers is you never want to put them in a situation like this where they end up getting themselves uh, stuck on a particular tile and blocked off. However, the AI seems to have done a good job of deciding where to actually put itself here because uh, it seems like they've managed to, uh, to uh, kite around the map in order to deal with these two units, so this is exactly how you should be playing right now. Uh, kite the unit around if you can, block off the tiles that uh, that they can move to, and hopefully uh, you can find yourselves a way at, find yourself a way out of that situation. Though I will say in this particular case, it would have been far more ideal uh, for them if they had managed to uh, come in with a skirmisher build because it would allow them to take advantage of the shorter range um, in order to uh, hopefully get a little bit more consistent uh, damage out. Because again, their movement is uh, a little bit more than dicey, and it also would be helping them in the situation where they are continuously getting pummeled by melee hits. They are incredibly weak to getting cornered, so just something to bear in mind. Also, I was a little bit curious what would happen if you actually ended up losing a fight, so I put them in with one less unit. Alright, so skill-wise, the archer is a bit more limited than the warrior there. Uh, they start off with uh, daggers, shortbows, and crossbows. They still retain that ability to have 10% uh, higher uh, uh, health or MP. Again, uh, MP being particularly useful for finishers there. Essentially, uh, MP uh, plus or insight here is uh, the combination of what would have previously been uh, TP plus and MP plus. So, nice little combination there. Again, uh, resist to petrify and and charm. Uh, you don't see any of that in the uh, first chapter here, uh, so 
I'm not entirely sure why it's those two that were chosen, but anyhow, uh, Tremendous Shot is a, just like uh, Mighty Impact, a 100% uh, uh, hit, 100% crit, um, and 100% uh, chance to inflict any secondaries if you were to have one. Um, for secondary effects, by the way, what I'm talking about is uh, if you see anything, for example, in this slot over here where it says on hit, uh, that is a secondary effect. Now, uh, as far as their skills, uh, back attack is an automatic uh, that will uh, trigger every now and then. Uh, basically, this will just increase your... Uh, uh, It'll just increase your accuracy that round, so it's a nice little uh, bonus if you don't have anything else to do with it. It's always kind of been there as a nice little bonus, but, you know, there's other stuff that you can probably replace it with kind of situation. But, you know what? While we're low on slots in Chapter 1, we might as well go with that. So, uh, there we go. That is the Archer, um, and... I will say, uh, if you want to optimize your archers to do big punchy numbers, um, bear in mind that stuff like the, uh, the leather armor, the, uh, leather sleeves, and the linen slops all carry dex bonuses off them. Um, primarily the main thing that the archer needs to function is dexterity. They are a very, very simple class and always have been. If you can feed them dexterity, they will feed you big happy numbers to give you nice big endorphins in the brain. But, um, essentially they're actual penetration on their weapon is a little dicey. Um, so, for example, you know, while a two-handed sword might be throwing out 62s at that tier, um, that thing is only, or actually, no, actually, I believe the, uh, this way there is a better example. So, for example, a two-hander would be throwing out a 70 on its penetration, uh, whereas the long bow would be throwing out a 48. If you want a better explanation on what I mean by penetration, watch the armor breakdown. It seems to use the same system in Reborn, just rebalanced in a fun way that Honestly, feels a lot more understandable. Anyway, let's move on to the next one. All right, fun little note while we're here, by the way. Apparently, uh, if you uh, tell it to auto-equip or equip recommended for their spells, they will always uh, pick... Uh, they will attempt to equip you like the AI does, uh, basically giving you seemingly two preferable options for uh, overhead and missile, um, as well as uh, two uh, randos, uh, rando uh, debuffs if you have them. So that's just kind of neat. Moving on. Actually, I suppose we should cover these while we're here. So, uh, skill-wise, you've got uh, daggers, hammers, cudgels uh, for your offensive options. Um, I should point out, for hammers, this does not mean all hammers. This would be limited hammers, like the PSP version. Um, use that information as you will. Um, but uh, you still have stuff like uh, MP for or MP uh, plus with uh, insight. You have stuff like meditate automatically, uh, giving you extra uh, extra points along the way. Uh, you have uh, coax for recruiting lizards into your team, which is always a good time. Um, if you're looking for uh, more of a uh, debuff landing type of situation, uh, you have something like uh, concentration over here, which will automatically give you spell strike at the start of your turn. Um, and uh, overall spell-wise, for all of your basic elements, uh, you've got access to... Uh, so I figured we'd go back to the shop here real quick to take a look at this, but on the element side, for most of your primary elements, uh, you have access to one missile, one overhead, and one instill in Chapter 1. Um, and then you have the same for light, but with Exorcism, Awaken, and uh, Heal, although they do not get access to the light side of things, but they do get dark, um, and they can equip anything off the uh, dark list here, so overhead, uh, uh, missiles, uh, you also get uh, drain health, um, you get uh, instills, which are only going to be available to the uh, fencers. Um, you get uh, slow, paralytic, poison, sleep, and charm. Say, uh, depending on what you're going for, your build will work a little bit differently. So, for example, if you wanted to go for more of a debuff caster, you're going to want concentration on there. Uh, whereas, for example, if you're going for something more uh, offense orientated, you're want to you're going to want to go for a uh, stick and uh, more meditate. Realistically, you should always have meditate on a caster. Why wouldn't you? Um, but uh, for example, for a debuff caster, their damage really doesn't matter as much, so you can give them a sticker in order to give them that parry. Um, meanwhile, if you're uh, looking for something that's a bit more, you know, offense magic orientated, that's when you would go for the cudgel. Um, please bear in mind, again, their uh, their overall magic stuff does actually uh, use their weapon skill these times around. Um, basically allows you to switch between uh, weapons and uh, magic kind of on the fly there. Um, but this essentially means that uh, you can uh, you can still have a parry wizard, um, which can then immediately pivot into something like a warrior or an archer or whatever else with that dagger skill. Um, so just uh, something fun to think about. Additionally, while I wouldn't recommend uh, putting a light augment on a uh, spellcaster like this, I just happen to have one on hand. Um, bear in mind you still have stuff like uh, wrathful strike here, scaling uh, scaling cudgel damage off of light. So potentially you could have a little bit of a you know more melee orientated uh, caster there, though. Really 
realistically, this is more useful on a cleric. Um, I just It's just something I figured I'd go ahead and throw out there. All right, so wizards and enchantresses are going to be your more consistent option when it comes to range damage. Um, basically, when it comes to their uh, damage, it's going to have less uh, crazy numbers than, for example, uh, uh, your ranged options can do in this early game here. Um, but they are going to be far more consistent, and they can't be parried or deflected. So that's a nice little, uh, little thing there. But again, as you can see, they can still throw out very good numbers. Uh, they won't go crazy high, but uh, they will do a solid, uh, solid amount of things. Um, additionally, the amount of debuffs they get is actually kind of, uh, kind of up there as far as this series goes, um, because they actually uh, get more than they did before this time around. Um, while they did get quite a few options in the uh, PSP version, you may notice uh, that uh, some of them have essentially been kind of boiled down for redundancy. So, for example, before you uh, had the uh, the poison mist uh, that was available on water, and you had the poison uh, uh, that was available on uh, dark. Now, more or less, it just seems to function the same way as both of them combined. We just have the dark version of Poison Mist that uh, still has about the same range as the original did. Uh, the main reason they used the water version before was for its range. The main reason they used the dark one was because, well, you were running dark and you wanted slightly better accuracy, though realistically, it was kind of just a straight-up redundancy in most situations. Uh, dark had more options, but it was less dedicated in those options. Now, dark essentially has a... Uh, well, the dedication for the debuffs. Uh, dark is the one you run for debuffs. Uh, the debuffs are just all listed as dark. There's not really, at least in the early game, again, as far as I'm aware. Um, but uh, but yes, you can see that uh, there's less redundancy. It's just they're all on one list. You don't have to search around for what's where. Um, Debuff-wise, I will point out that Poison is, without any question whatsoever, um, the highest DPS thing available in Chapter 1. You can get a lot of numbers up, uh, you can get a lot of numbers up in a lot of different ways. Um, but I should point out that Poison scales, um, and it seems to roughly do about 10% damage uh, per tick. It ticks about three times per round. This means that Poison is absolutely devastating. And in this early game, it's doing about uh, 60 to 70 uh, uh, damage in Poison per tick per round, give or take. Uh, again, it, it generally goes about two to three times uh, per a unit's turn. Uh, so it is absolutely devastating if it lands. It does quite a bit of damage. Um, and uh, yeah, if you happen to get the uh, full five units on there, that is effectively hundreds of damage every few RT ticks. Um, obviously, they're not very good at taking physical hits, so the, uh, you know, they're having a little bit of a rough time here. Granted, most of these are randos that I literally just turned into these classes. If you're wondering why one of them is doing drastically more damage than the rest, that's the only one that's actually been trained as a clear, <laughs> as a uh, caster. Um, Burb, for example, is not one of them. He's not doing particularly well. Um, and I believe they're, let's see, Ophelia is one of the ones that's been training as a cleric, so her mind is good, she can land debuffs well, um, but uh, she's not very good as far as uh, raw damage goes. Uh, it would have been the, um, well, there she goes. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're only good casters already gone, so uh, I think we're gonna go ahead and uh, give this one to the AI. In case you're curious, by the way, um, you can deploy up to eight units in training. I'm just putting five out there to see if... Uh, to kind of just see how they do. I know that I gave the Warriors six. It was kind of unfair. Um, I really should be doing six for all of them, but anyway. Moving right along to the next class. I think you get the general deal of what these guys do. Right, next up on our list is going to be the next guy that you start off with, and that would be Canopus, the Vartan. Now, technically speaking, you can actually get up to four uh, Vartans uh, in the intro, potentially up to seven, I believe. I'm, so I'm a little bit unclear exactly on whether or not you can get the uh, second uh, thing of class marks to drop. Like, one time I've gotten them from one place, one time I've gotten them from another place, but I've never been able to uh, kind of double drop those class marks. Um, but yes, all of your Hawkmen can become Vartans, and the Vartan is by far your longest, uh, kind of your best mobility unit uh, in this early game. Now, I will say Canopus actually makes a unusually good case for the class, because while it's good, and it's very versatile, it is not as good as he makes it seem. Um, so it's an interesting case of... Uh, uh, th so the Vartan, since the PSP version, has basically been this thing with high mobility, a high amount of options, but a kind of high cost in terms of their movement, so his turn speed is pretty quick, but his actual, uh, his actual uh, kind of cost per tile moved is pretty high. Um, 
Which actually, by the way, I forgot to mention for the archers. If you may notice right here, the archers are actually uh, faster than the Vartan. Uh, the archers actually do move pretty darn quick this time around. Um, not as fast as the clerics. Them suckers are just speedy as hell. But um, but yeah, when it comes to the uh, the Vartan, they're kind of uh, they're pretty good as far as speed goes. Not to mention Canopus by himself is just pretty fast. But they get access to uh, missile spells primarily. I put a bunch of them on there because I thought it was funny. Uh, they get access to uh, fists, daggers, axes, hammers, cudgels, bows, and crossbows. As well as the usual uh, HP and MP up. Uh, as well as uh, resist petrify, resist charm, uh, fey pact for recruiting fairies if you somehow find one in chapter 1. Um, and then Hoponga wins for stagger and air averse. Uh, this basically just means that his air spells will be doing extra damage. Now, uh, the, what this uh, setup basically means is he is set up to both do, uh, well, to basically be a tribred. He does uh, he does his melee pretty well. Additionally, the uh, parry goes pretty well with the fact that you usually want to have him off by himself. Counterattack doesn't really help that much when you're off by yourself. Um, you really just want to have uh, mobility and defensive options. Um, having a uh, light weapon or a light ranged weapon of some variety is fantastic for uh, picking off, for example, uh, squishies at different ranges, especially the fact that you can just put him up on castle walls and plink away. Um, technically speaking, if you want to have him win the training uh, mode all by himself, all you do is park him up on the top of the wall and nobody else can do anything. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the parry on a knife, for example, is very good. Not to mention it weighs pretty much nothing uh, compared to his other options. The axe, it weighs four. You know, a crossbow weighs four. Uh, something like a bigger axe would probably also weigh four. Um, uh, even uh, upgrading to a uh, dirk here will still only be weighing two. Hammers weigh seven. Um, but basic sticker or dirk or battle knife or something like that is going to be a very lightweight weapon. Um basically makes up for the fact that he's spending a lot to move the tiles that he does. But he is, uh, like I said earlier, Canopus makes a unusually good case for this class because his stats are roughly 10 points higher than everybody else. So, um, so yeah, it, it's not exactly the most fair comparison. Uh, his strength and dex are freakishly high. Um, but again, high mobility, good options, uh, great class for uh, being a, a skirmisher kind of off on the sides, harassing wherever needed. If they have units that they can't really hurt with their light melee weapons, uh, their spellcasting might be the trick. Um, pretty much any stat spread will work for them because, again, they're a tribrid. They will have something that they can make work. Um, because of the fact that they've got uh, fantastic mobility, again, they start off with five as opposed to the standard four. Um, this means that they do a great job of uh, uh, taking advantage of cards. Now, don't do what the AI did here and just send them right in the middle. That's not exactly going to go terribly well. But, uh, but yes. Um, in the early game, uh, Canopus is far and away the uh, strongest character you've got in your team. Again, like 10 points of strength and dex is just not really something that you're going to make up for, uh, regardless of efficient training or skills or gear or whatever else. Um, but yeah, does, uh, does great numbers uh, with light weapons, just does a great job of adapting to situations. And he is one of those few cases where you can actually make a reasonable case for pretty much spending every round or every other round collecting some kind of card that will benefit one of his uh, potential options. Um, just because he'll be able to, uh, you know, go take advantage of, uh, of all those little bonuses and he's not losing anything, he's not having any opportunity cost uh, for going and taking those particular steps. Now, to show what I mean, let's go ahead and uh, hop into that one more time, but we're going to go ahead and take him off of AI. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, turn off this, and let's go give it another go here. First things first, uh, we kind of move him out towards the middle, uh, leave uh, leave both sides open just to see what's going on there. Uh, we see there's a special card. He's not going to be relying on his uh, specials very often, so we're just going to go ahead and uh, avoid that one. But we see that there's a crit bonus off to the side over there. Um, so we can go ahead and take a uh, tile that's going to completely deny any kind of uh, movement to anyone nearby. I'll just go ahead and uh, take a cast on this guy just to plank away at him a little bit. Uh, still leaves us within range of that uh, wizard over there. Uh, we're going to want to deal with him as a little bit of a uh, priority, but uh, either way. Um, okay, we see that we've got some casting coming from there as well. But we see that we've primarily got uh, indirect attacks. Uh, we can evade many of these uh, because uh, they're uh, using matching element attacks. Uh, we seem to be able to, uh, to evade them a little bit better. But because we put them in a weird spot here, we can actually go ahead and uh, take this kind of movement here. I was going to go for the crit, but in this particular case, uh, we potentially might be able to uh, bully that wizard a little bit better uh, by just moving over here. So there we go. That uh, went ahead and uh, updated our attack roughly by 20 or 30 in his case. Again, he has unusually high stats. I cannot stress this enough. 
And those cards will primarily, in the case of the physical cards, they will be increasing your physical scaling. So if you have higher stats, you can take advantage of those physical cards unusually well. Uh, meaning that, for example, if you pick up a magic card, it'll help your magic penetration. If you pick up a physical card, however, um, you essentially are increasing your physical scaling. Uh, the difference between this being that uh, if you, like for example, if you're low on stats um, and you get a magic card, then you are able to more consistently do damage. However, if you pick up a physical card, you're only improving your scaling, meaning that if you are already losing on stats, it actually doesn't do anything for you. Um, if you pick up a crit card, however, that would be a lot better in almost every circumstance. The crit cards are, without any question, uh, the, uh, the strongest of the cards that are available, uh, but they are also not very common, and they also definitely cut both ways. So if, you know, it's not really one of those things where you really want to prioritize one thing over another, but either way, you know, if you happen to have the option of a, a crit card and one of the others, more often than not, uh, like crit cards have a more universal application, but again, it's something that is fairly random all the same, uh, so you wouldn't really necessarily be able to do any, uh, you know, I say any, you wouldn't be able to get too crazy with it, but, uh, you know, it still just might be a little bit of a nice bonus to have. Now, those cards, uh, due to the way that they spawn, um, most of the time they're going to be spawning along lines of engagement. Uh, so, for example, um, at the very start, usually they'll end up spawning in roughly, uh, like, approximately to whoever should have an advantage. Lore-wise, that is. So, like, in training fights, they almost always start at the middle of the map and roughly remain there. Um, for example, in something like uh, when you go to, uh, to Chrysoro at the very start, um, you'll notice that uh, they happen to mostly spawn on your end, because lore-wise, you have an advantage. Um, however, if you go fight uh, uh, Nybeth down the road, you'll notice that most of them spawn close to him, because in the story, he has an advantage there. Um, it's a nice little kind of uh, nudge uh, from the storytellers there, as far as where they happen to land up, but, you know, it's a nice little thing. Um, again... You, bear in mind, you can have an entire team fully stacked with cards. Actually, this is a challenge run I plan to do down the road, um, where, like, for example, if you were to stack an entire enemy team with cards and then just kind of engage them at that point, um, honestly, it's still completely winnable. Uh, good moves are always going to matter a lot more than these cards. They're just a nice little bonus to have. However, I will note that crit rates in general are drastically lower, so unless you are having a fantastic day on your character or you happen to be running a uh, luck build, um, which you can't exactly optimize for uh, here in this early game, uh, then you're going to have a little bit of a harder time as far as that goes. Now, you get the general idea here. Um, it's actually kind of cool that uh, you see the AI understanding how range works. Man, oh man, you have no idea how happy I was to see this when it first came around. But you can see that uh, they're trying to actually get out of my firing range. I love this. I love this so much. <laughs> I mean, that guy's decided to become a little bit aggressive. Those two think that they can take it. But for the most part, they're going to try to get out of my firing range. I just love it. All right. And uh, there we go. We go ahead and unlock a finisher on this guy. Um, I don't think they can actually see the full extent of your firing arc. But again, the fact that they're just kind of hanging out just, just, just out of it is pretty funny. Um, like, we can't exactly reach her. He's just on the line. I, I have a feeling he's just feeling more confident because of those cards. I have noticed in some cases, if characters uh, will pick up more cards, they sometimes get more confident. Um, I mean, realistically, we're just doing plank damage anyway, so they're probably not seeing a whole lot of threat out of this. Um, but you get the general idea. We could probably get closer, drag him in a little bit, you know, do a little bit more from that. But they're just going to continue trying to, uh, to figure out where I can hit them and where I can't. <laughs> Oh man, I love this this new AI. It's just so fun to play around with. All right, let's move on to the next thing. You get the idea. Alrighty, next up we got the uh, the old faithful here, uh, the knight. So the cool thing about the knight um, uh, is they end up uh, starting with a lot of what were previously their uh, end game skills in back in um, uh, the PSP version, and they start off with them, you know, fairly early. Uh, so. Uh, they uh, they start off with their uh, with their phalanx. Uh, they start off with their uh, sanctuary, interestingly enough. Um, and additionally, they start off with uh, rampant aura. So they'll basically have all this stuff from again previously, like the kind of later to mid game kind of situation. Um, and uh, they'll just have them immediately. So uh, Phalanx is, or re sorry, Rampart Aura is as it always was. It's just denying movement. Sanctuary uh, prevents undead units uh, from uh, stopping or entering those particular tiles. Interestingly enough, this actually changed a little bit since the PSP version. Um, this actually has a uh, elevation difference limit, um, but uh, this actually prevents them from moving through those tiles at all. There was a thing in, uh, in PSP where technically speaking, they just couldn't end their turn on those tiles. Uh, meaning that uh, they could 
fact, in some cases, still just happily walk around it, but they couldn't attack the unit that had it. But in some cases, they could just kind of accidentally get themselves pushed into those ranges. But yeah, they're just prevented from entering those spots now. Um, Phalanx is uh, changed from being a uh, trigger or from a uh, activatable skill that used to be 90% damage reduction. Uh, now it is 60% damage reduction, uh, which is just enough so that you're actually um, like, that unit can still get targeted. They can still take damage, but it is a massive overall uh, damage reduction. But at the same time, you're not running around keeping them naked for the purpose of, uh, you know, for the purpose of making them uh, uh, cheese, uh, cheese the fact that the AI could previously not see what it did. Now, as far as uh, night uh, building options, uh, they are about as uh, about as they were before. Um, they get access to uh, to swords uh, as kind of their standard swords, axes, hammers of the uh, light uh, varieties. Uh, hammers, presumably they would still have access to the heavy variety, but there are none in Chapter 1. Um, they don't get access to heavy axes still. Um, crossbows, uh, they get the uh, light variants only. Uh, they get access to pincer attacks. Um, they get access to HP+, plus and MP+, plus, as you'd expect, along with uh, resist petrify and resist charm. Um, and and uh, yeah, they get uh, access to recruit right off the bat. So uh, just like before, you don't have to get them up to level 5 to get this, you just kind of get this. Actually, I believe... Uh, I forget what level it unlocked at. I either way, it was pretty much immediate uh, when this ended up unlocking. Again, you don't have to unlock the skills as the class, they're just available. If you're in that class, you just have the skills, you don't have to worry about any, again, background, esoteric, whatever. It's just... it's just there. Alright, so... Uh, let's go ahead and see how they do. I mean, overall build-wise, I have to say, in the early game, if you're going, for example, you want to go for a funny skirmisher build, I liked uh, making a axe and crossbow knight, uh, building them up for uh, dexterity. Um, but the standard, you know, you got uh, you got your hammers, you got your swords, the usual kind of standard, you know, clanky dude in armor kind of situation. Um, I'm only going to put four of them out here um, on this particular map because, uh, well, quite frankly, the knights are pretty darn tough. Um, just like many of the other classes, uh, this is a uh, human-only type situation, so no birds or lizards for this one. And here we go. Alright, so knights are going to be your vitality specialist. If you want to build somebody uh, strictly for uh, defense in most situations, go ahead and uh, train them up as a knight. Um, so vitality uh, functions in all situations. Uh, basically, it is a all-around defensive skill. Um, so it will uh, it'll functionally be able to defend yourself, uh, defend you against magic, ranged, and physical in equal measure. Um, but uh, you will uh, you will essentially be uh, losing out on offense a little bit by going down this, these guys' route. Their strength isn't terrible, but just so you know, I mean they're not going to be like fully optimized for offense. They are strictly the defense specialist. Um, they do feel like they're a bit, uh, kind of a bit expanded uh, because uh, back in the PSP version, they felt like strictly they were for area denial. It was actually very difficult to make, uh, for example, a um, kind of like, a, I like to call it a turret build work. Uh, so that would be, uh, back in that version, it was more optimal to go for a crossbow and shield uh, because effectively just be stacking for extra uh, defense. But because there's more emphasis on uh, armor over shields this time around, uh, shields become more of the offensive pushback option. When you want to push a line back, that's when you have the shields. Uh, so for example, uh, axe and shield and that kind of thing is very, very good for uh, just... Uh, it's kind of pushing your way through the other uh, other lines there. It is a uh, faster way to attack. So it's a great way to kind of reposition the line, so to speak, uh, take enemy squads and put them in a more pinched off position. Uh, because of the fact that they've got Rampart Aura, they're uh, hard to actually flank around. Uh, units uh, usually have to be in a kind of off to the sides position in order to be able to get a back attack on them. Um, meaning that they're actually very good at uh, keeping uh, pincers in place if you get them set up. Um, however, the fact that they don't get access to uh, counter in uh, Chapter 1 uh, is a little bit of a change. Um, it does feel appropriate. Again, they are very heavily orientated towards defense. And I have to say, uh, when it comes to their ranged options, I feel like they're a bit stronger in the range department this time around. Now, you might notice that their damage doesn't necessarily go up that much. Uh, actually, as far as crossbows on a knight, um, they are still a fairly weak thing. But because of the fact that uh, units generally do more damage and there's kind of less... Uh, Kind of complete armor plank, so to speak. Um, you functionally can still throw out little bits uh, here and there, and it does actually add up. So you can have a unit that can specialize primarily in being a wall, um, just kind of blocking off particular areas, and then just taking shots of opportunity at anybody that wanders by. Eventually, you know, throwing out something like a, uh, a finisher in order to do the big numbers. So overall, I'd say that's a very solid way to actually play them. Their defense, especially with something like Phalanx, is high enough that they're able to pull that kind of weirdness off. Uh, without any sort of difficulties. And there you go, there's a uh, finisher uh, pulling out a crit for you. 
Um, and as you can see, just uh, e even though they're pretty vastly outnumbered, I decided to give them even one less in this particular instance. Uh, their defense is fairly high. Uh, they haven't rolled that many uh, parries up to this point, um, but their defense is high enough that they're able to get by just fine. Um, showing off right there that uh, shield, you know, shield attacks are still perfectly viable. They're a they're pretty much the best way to finish off a unit um, because uh, shields, as far as I can tell, sh you can't parry a shield. Um, so shields seem to function very differently from weapons um, because they don't count as a normal attack. They basically count as a physical push. Um, so for example, if you, uh, if you have an activated skill and you don't want to waste the skill, you can also go for the shield bash instead. Um, it's something that you could do in PSP, but realistically, unless you were vastly winning the, uh, the stats uh, kind of uh, contest, most of the time, it was just for repositioning. In this particular case, it feels very appropriate. Um, I don't know if anyone here has been hit by a shield before, but uh, yeah, it hurts. <laughs> that was one of those things that uh, that I've mentioned a few times was a little silly in the PSP version, because like, you know, I get it, it's a pushback option, but shields hurt. They hurt a lot. I mean, it's a big, chunky piece of metal, and especially if, it's, if somebody's strong enough, that's like being hit by a car. So anyway, feels fantastic as far as that goes, and there's a uh, man. There's all those nice little activatables triggering as they do. That uh, one warrior guy thought he was saved, but then comes in for the shield bash from behind. Um, uh, if you're looking for a, to optimize a big hitter early uh, night, though, um, go for something like a hammer and the espis, uh, which is uh, showing up a chapter early this time around, um, and uh, does come with a decent uh, strength bonus out there, so you can actually stack them in metal armor. So. Uh, uh, you give them all of their uh, their chains and gaunts, uh, plus an ass piece, and you've suddenly got an extra 10 strength on them. It's good stuff. It's, uh, you know, it's very solid as far as that goes. Um, overall, I'd say uh, knights are extremely reliable, and they've been a fantastic bodyguard. Uh, they're great for turning situations around. Um, they're still the best at area denial, um, especially with uh, Phalanx. If you pick up a couple of skill cards, they are the best early example of, uh, of making... I can't say early example. Okay, fine. Um, they are in chapter one. They are going to make the most use of those skill cards because even even if you pick up one of them, you functionally have phalanx activated at all times. Um, it feels like about a 60% ish chance, and then it goes up to about 80%. I think uh, with those cards, those numbers, as far as I can tell, aren't really listed anywhere. But still, as you can see, um, like they're just running on phalanx full time right now. So uh, you know, it's uh, definitely turning out to be an easy time for them. And uh, because of the fact that they don't have too many things that use MP, um, they, uh, well, you can see they're pretty good at uh, making those finishers hit hard. That's uh, that's the benefit of having the uh, the right equipment on the right people. I know it seems like a minor adjustment, but those little minor adjustments that you had to really, 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 really build for in PSP matter a lot more here, uh, just so you know. Um, again, we're, we're looking at a nice little mix of new and old, so... Uh, you know how back in the SNES, you, you know, stacking stats made a really big deal? Well, you know, here we are. Okay, let's move on to the next class. Alrighty, next up on the list is going to be the Berserker. So, uh, these are your uh, AoE uh, melee hitter kind of dudes. Uh, high damage, low defense, that kind of deal. Uh, so, uh, these guys did change a decent chunk from the PSP version, but as with everything else, they're just more fluid now. So, uh, you've got uh, fists, daggers, uh, axes, uh, hammers, and cudgels like before. Uh, same old uh, with the HP+, plus, MP+, plus if you want them, but they are uh, getting the most damage out of pincer attacks. While they can't guarantee those uh, knockbacks or anything else, they definitely will be doing uh, more damage because they get access to rank 2 of this immediately in chapter 1 here. Uh, they get access to Siege, which I just want to point out with Siege, while you are technically sacrificing a thing of movement, bear in mind you're not paying any additional cost for that extra movement. So there are plenty of cases where, for example, if you race the two units side by side, technically speaking, they would end up reaching their destination at about the same time, they're just going to take their turns in a different order. So while it does feel like they're initially slower, really what this is reducing is their overall mobility in terms of being able to adapt, but it does allow them to uh, get through Rampart Aura. So it kind of depends on what you want to do with them. The right unit with Siege, uh, getting past uh, Rampart Aura at the right time, can be absolutely devastating, but, you know, then you have a lot of those cases where you really would be like liking to move more than three tiles. Any dang ways, uh, so you got a uh, pretty wide loadout of stuff, let's go see how they do. And also going down their skills here, by the way, um, as far as Berserk goes, yes it is automatic this time around. Uh, but you'll notice because of the fact that they typically end up uh, stacking stuff like uh, strength, uh, they actually do not have as much of a problem with uh, accidentally auto-berserking as you might think. 
Uh, so due to all this, uh, their shield bashes tend to do comparable to weapon damage, kind of giving the option to uh, pivot into a shield bash instead of going for an AoE. All of it is definitely going to be situational. But as before, the interesting thing with Berserk is that uh, it has a surprising amount of vertical forgiveness. Um, so, for example, if you wanted to open up um, you know, multiple props that were nearby, or you just happened to want to hit somebody on top of a cliff and had a way to attack sideways, you know, there's uh, always kind of the option to do so. Now, I went ahead and uh, gave them four units uh, just, like, uh, just like last time, just to see if they can function as well as the knights. Um, so, realistically speaking, um, these guys have uh, quite a decent bit uh, more offense here. Um, and as far as counter options, they're definitely far more available. They get access to heavy axes, they get access to, uh, uh, you know, uh, heavier uh, uh, variants of hammers. Um, they get access to daggers, which are actually an interesting little pivot uh, if you happen to have a, a higher dex melee unit uh, that you wanted to uh, switch into a big hitter. Um, as with everything, though, they all will scale a combination of dex and strength. Um, it's just, for example, if you happen to have a high dex unit, you might consider making them go for daggers instead, because a dagger unit, or as I like to think of them more of like a short sword viking, um, are effectively going to be uh, do attacking faster than most other units. Interestingly enough, if you switch these guys over to AI, they do a pretty fantastic job of uh, trying to avoid friendly fire wherever they can, um, and seem to do a great job of using their shields, so it's kind of great uh, for, uh, you know, the whole uh, Viking aesthetic that they've got going on. Like right there, he saw that he would uh, get a pincer attack if he went ahead and used the shield, um, but he would essentially be hitting a friend if he uh, activated his Berserk, so he decided to go for the shield bash instead. So they're really great as far as that goes. Um, they really, they really just kind of nailed the Viking aesthetic for this one it feels really good um they do a whole lot more with uh, shields than seemingly everybody else so um i love how that ended up turning out with these guys just in general the whole uh you know oh no i'll accidentally not be able to use my berserk when i want to thing is not as much of a thing as uh as you know it was pointed out to be but for example, it looks like we are about to get a fantastic advertisement for why Berserk is awesome. Um, because as far as melee goes, they have the highest single potential uh, hit damage um, in uh, in the entire early game here uh, with uh, Berserk potentially being able to hit multiple tiles um, at the same time. So there we go right there. So potentially throwing out uh, hundreds of damage uh, per, uh, per swing. Um, and it's, this is especially good for something like, uh, say, a heavy axe at the very start of the game. Um, and uh, say if they happen to have picked up a few crit cards and just happen to crit all of those, suddenly, you know, they're throwing out well over 2,000 damage over in a single swing. I have seen it go higher than that. Um, so there's plenty of ways that you can make these guys work. Again, regardless of what stats they're running, they do a pretty good job of... Uh, of just keeping that offense flowing. Um, they're fantastic for finishers. If you're looking for a early game, you know, beatdown unit, as you can see right there, Ice is absolutely winning in Chapter 1. Um, I can't emphasize enough, Chapter 1. <laughs> but uh, you got Tyrant's Mace, uh, you've got, um, and you've got uh, Ice Prison that are coming off of Axes and Hammers. Um, so just like before, they do scale with the Ice element. Um, Lore-wise, you know, Ice is the thing that was supposed to have started uh, the whole over battle thing so makes sense we are you know at the start here any dang ways uh you know they just feel very good to use um definitely would recommend uh keeping them on uh, ice if you are if you have a ice uh, denim for example uh, definitely would end up going berserker on them so they really really hit hard uh their defense is a little weaker than it was in the psp version um but uh, but yeah no they feel like they feel like an absolute force to be reckoned with here, uh, as you can tell they they were once again outnumbered and just like the knights uh, they were able to hold their own just fine. Um, not to mention this terrain isn't exactly suitable for berserks, and yet they're doing just fine. All right, so that'll be that. Let's move on to the next one. So the next one here is one that honestly it doesn't make sense throwing them into a fight because it's not really going to be going terribly well because you can only get up to three of them in Chapter 1. Uh, the uh, first beast uh, tamer that you uh, kill uh, when uh, rescuing Sestina is going to be the, uh, well, the three class marks that you can get for this class in the early game. So uh, these are basically entirely, as it says, the uh, your kind of beast wrangling class. Um, now... Unless I've missed something, there aren't really any beasts or dragons for you to recruit in the first chapter, because you essentially only get access to the class in the one chapter that has a dragon. Um, I've 
one thing I want to say, if for some reason somebody from the balance team is watching, it would be so nice uh, for somebody to patch in the option uh, to have tame on that first uh, uh, first uh, beast tamer that you run into. Because think how nice it would be if you like you have a recruit on there and then you recruit the guy and you're like, oh wait, he has tame, and then you go get your dragon in chapter one. But that would be neat. Anyway, so um, there might be ways to do it, but to my knowledge, there are not. So. They get access to fists, axes, hammers, cudgels, whips, blow guns, importantly, and bows. This means that uh, they get the, uh, access to the best uh, early game, uh, well, that is to say the, uh, the best as far as I'm aware, um, option uh, when it comes to a luck build. So there's actually a item that I uh, used extensively for a PSP level 1 there. Um, that was the, uh, the Garage's blow gun. Uh, comes with a uh, 10 luck bonus. Um, so... Basically, weapons in both hands seem to give you their full bonuses this time. It's not just, you know, an extra thing in the background, as far as I'm aware. Um, before, you would only get the bonus while you were actively using that uh, piece of gear for something, unless it was a shield. But in this one, you do seem to get your full bonuses, meaning that the Garage's Blowgun, um, because of the fact that Beast Tamers can equip it, it allows them to do a lot of things better. Um, so, for example, uh, 5 decks, 4 agility, that is going to be pretty solid in its own right. Actually, a Blowgun plus a Buckler is, a, like, is pretty much the best avoidance bonus you can get in the early game. You can have a very dodgy Beast Tamer, in many ways, making them kind of the dodge specialist uh, in in, uh, in chapter one here. Um, but I mean, blowguns in general, they don't do much upfront damage, but their finishers scale excellently. Another ice based finisher, by the way. Um, again, I cannot emphasize enough chapter one. Chapter one. We're in chapter one. We are not in any other chapter. All right, cool. Not everything is ice. Just throwing that out there. Just got to automatically correct the thing I'm throwing out there. But yeah, lightweight weapon, great dodge, has a luck bonus. Pretty decent attack value, all things considered. Um, so yeah, blowgun build, very uh, very solid there. But if you were to just equip the blowgun in their offhand, uh, that is a nice potential little 10% uh, uh, crit chance all of a sudden. Um, anyway, so fists, if you want to uh, hit harder and have the option to counter with them. Uh, axes, if you want to go for something a little more defensive. Uh, so for something like uh, the hand axe and a shield, is going to give them some pretty solid vitality bonuses. Uh, that two vitality off the hand axe doesn't seem like much, but it's... Uh, it's significant. Um, anyway, uh, you have stuff like hammers if you want to go f more down the strength route. Um, hammer and uh, blowgun was my personal preference. Um, but basically having that 10% chance to crit on a tyrant's mace is... Uh, it's hilarious. Suddenly this unit that was doing 100s is throwing out 500 pluses. So uh, yeah, um, not the highest chance to proc in the world, but it's there. Uh, ranged option-wise, they get access to uh, short bows, which I don't have any in, tame, uh, in uh, stock at the moment. Um, they uh, don't get access to crossbows, but they do get uh, blowguns. So, uh, fantastic there. Um, and yeah, as with the others, you can give them uh, most pieces of gear. Generally speaking, they're more geared... Well, if you're going for more melee, they're better for strength. If you're going for uh, range, they're better for dex. Personally, I'd say, like, dex plus blowgun, but really you can't go wrong with whatever build you go with them. Um, now, they get early access to the lobber. Uh, this actually used to be a chapter 2 thing in the original game. Um, so the, uh, the lobber just basically means that you can throw items. Uh, this can work with a wide variety of items, um, and if it works anything like the previous version uh, did, uh, this primarily is healing items on the low end, um, then becomes more fancy things as time goes on. Again, I cannot elaborate further on that, and I'm actually not aware of the full mechanics of it anyway. Um, but they do get access to Siege if, you, if uh, they get stuck in any particular situation. If you were to find a way to uh, get a beast unit in the early game, no, you can't hire Gr Gamps Griffins. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, you, you can hire uh, both beasts and dragons, um, and then you can uh, also empower beasts. Um, there's technically a fun thing with all of this that I, I can't go into that. Okay, okay, anyway. So, uh, so yeah, that's Beast Tamers in a nutshell. Um, they're just a fun, versatile class that, uh, well, that does the monster thing, but honestly can still function just fine even if there's no monsters around. Uh, but they can be an item support for Chapter 1. All right, moving on. Alrighty, so I'm going to throw this one out there uh, at, at the very end here. Um, so, basically, clerics are more or less the same as they always were. 
they heal, they exercise, they remove debuffs, and they have access to Sanctuary far earlier this time. And additionally, you don't have to transfer in Meditate, it's just something they know, which is fantastic. Now, I want to throw this out here because a lot of uh, a lot of the other previews were having issues uh, when it comes to... Uh, uh, when it comes to Nibeth, uh, or Nibeth, or whatever you want to call him here, um, because, uh, you know, the, he's technically supposed to be a chapter one, like, early mini-boss here. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, the actual rules of this have changed to something more akin to the original uh, SNES version of, uh, of Locked here. Namely, your uh, healing, while it, while it did damage in... Um, uh, in the PSP version, generally speaking, it was something very oddly specific. Like, you basically had to train them as an enchantress or a wizard or whatever, uh, get access to spellcraft, then you transfer in spellcraft to your cleric, and then you can, you know, then you can do okay damage with these guys. You don't have to do any of that setup, because, uh, I mean, look at this right here. They can just go ahead and do, you know, their, uh, their damage just fine, as you can see. They don't need any additional bonuses because these guys are actually weak to holy rather than being able to be affected by holy. Um, so this basically means that if you want to make a absolute joke out of this fight, all you really got to do is uh, is uh, make your entire party into clerics, um, give them exercise, give them heal, um, drop them into this fight, and go make yourself a cup of coffee. Um, just uh, the AI will handle the rest because they can do uh, more damage than these guys can actually take by the time they get close, and due to Meditate, they will have enough uh, MP built up to be able to just simply exercise them out of the way. Um, after about halfway through this fight, uh, uh, Nidoth will run out of uh, reinforcements. He only, only has about eight extra zombies. Um, as you can see, they can still shield bash pretty effectively too if you decide to uh, train them up uh, uh, to be uh, more physical classes. Um, in this particular file, I was training them to actually be uh, kind of power archers, but you know what, screw it, the dexterity works out just fine in this case. Um, but as you can see, they are, f like, fully shredding through these guys, like they're absolutely nothing. Um, they're healing far outpaces any kind of damage these guys can throw out. Um, and then, yeah, don't forget to set your uh, windows to automated and, um, you know, just uh, laugh at the ensuing consequences. Um, I decided to put Canopus into an archer just to kind of speed things up a little bit. Um, but there is a hilarious circumstance where I decided not to bring him one time and just simply have them beat Nibeth with sticks um, until he finally died. Now, interestingly enough, they can absolutely get rank from uh, rank 1 cudgels all the way up to rank 10 cudgels in approximately 5 minutes. Um, you just turn it on turbo, you turn off the, uh, you turn on the uh, faster animations, and you just watch as he gets beaten with sticks. Um, it is a very, very funny way <laughs> to, uh, uh, to make your uh, first uh, Nibeth fight uh, very memorable. Um, but yes, as you can see, they can handle this fight absolutely fine with no trouble whatsoever. Um, now, clerics in general uh, have become a decent bit uh, more offensive this time around, um, gaining access to their cudgel finisher far easier uh, because of the fact that any time that they actually uh, target anything offensively with their heals, they will be training up their cudgel skill. Um, bear in mind that regular heals will not actually work for that. Um, it should probably be noted that healcraft is pretty good this time around, so it is worth uh, keeping fairy scale powder on them. Um, but if you were to give them uh, the uh, Spellcraft buff for this section as well, it also would uh, be pretty worthwhile. Um, that all being said, none of it's really particularly necessary, though this particular exploit is actually pretty good if you want to... Well, I say exploit, it's more like uh, it's just kind of there for the taking. It's kind of clear, you know, these guys are meant to be exorcists. I mean, they were literally called exorcists in the SNES version. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so this... Uh, this ends up working particularly well. You can get yourself, um, like I know on in general, I've gotten about five stat cards off this uh, because these guys have a chance to either drop their equipment or they have a chance to drop a card. And it feels like the cards were pretty well preferable for them. So yeah, they do seem to go for that a decent bit. So, you know, don't make this fight harder than it has to be. If you're going to fight the, uh, you know, if you're going to fight something all nasty and moldy, you might as well bring that holy bleach. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it makes this fight super easy. I, I just love that this is a thing. Um, because again, this is just one of those fights that uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, folks would have difficulty with. Um, it's great to see that there is a kind of early game way to make this easy that doesn't involve just grinding. Um, but it does require some kind of lateral thinking, which is... Like, it just feels good. It just feels great. Again, uh, Nibeth, uh, even on the um, even on the high end, can be thrown out uh, around like 160s to 200s. Sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes more than that. But as you can see, they're getting healed for well over 100 within every round, and all of that damage is effectively focused on one unit that is not going to be getting one tapped. 
Meanwhile, if you decide to just make Canopus into a ranged unit, uh, he can, uh, you know, just go dunk on everybody in the background, so why not? Um, especially if you decided to uh, pick up the... Um, uh, pick up some uh, early Peregrine Marks uh, from the Gamp fight. Um, decided to uh, not use Canopus for a little bit, but train him up as an Archer instead for higher dexterity. Then switched him back into a Varden for this fight to uh, have him shred with a shortbow. That works out just fine, especially if you pick up some uh, uh, Fizz Up cards in order to scale his damage even higher. Um, you can clown on this fight with absolutely no trouble. Um, Oh, and actually that part can be a little bit scary if he gets his crits up, but again, even with crits, um, if you have been... I mean, obviously this fight can be done in the most basic form that your party comes in with. I've done that myself. The rushdown is definitely harder to do, but many of the old things uh, still uh, still can be done. Um, though, uh, though, yeah, if you're coming in with any higher level, like if you have been min-maxing up to this point and you've gotten yourself up to the level cap of 11, um, then you should have no trouble here, which is especially funny because technically, uh, Nibbit's level is higher than it was before. Um, he came in, uh, I believe he came in at 5 or 6, uh, in the, uh, in the original version. Um, back in the SNES version, he just had way higher stats, which he does, technically does in this case too, but, uh, it's more so that he's a little bit more durable and does a decent bit uh, more overall magic damage, um, but he is far from the, uh, the SNES version's, like, utter invincibility that he ended up getting in some cases. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to share this, and uh, yeah, that's going to be all the classes uh, that we're going to be getting in uh, Chapter 1. So, I hope this has been, you know, a, a fun little adventure through uh, through what I can technically cover up to this point. Um, hope, uh, hope maybe you uh, learned something new, maybe had some ideas in mind. Again, don't forget that uh, the Perry Clerics are, or Perry Clerics and Perry Wizards and Remember, one-handed variants have that parry thing, so, uh, you know, have, uh, have that in mind for weird builds. Like, it, I know it seems like a weird detail to, uh, to get stuck on, but just the option for, uh, for parry on casters leads to, uh, leads to a lot of, uh, thoughts of, like, a sort of a skirmisher, uh, wizard kind of situation. Anyway, anyway, alright, that's that. I will see you guys in the next one. Let me know if there's any questions that you have, and, uh, have yourselves an awesome one. Take care.